prayed off and on because I thought if I write more down than just one page, we'll all be in great trouble. We'll be here for hours and hours and hours. So I want to start by just talking about God's super plan. And that is that he has a super plan. And when you see it, your eyes open. It was just neat to see all the brothers and sisters uh, that were able to go and to see their eyes open when they'd see different sights. You know, things that I'd seen before. I couldn't wait to see how they would react and what have you. And uh, the neat thing is, is what we do have, you could pick up dirt, it's not going to save you. You could look at, you know, a plant, it's, it's not going to save you. It's through the Word of God that we get salvation. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ, right? It's through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's through the work of the Spirit in our lives who isn't confined to Israel. Amen? God is not bound. So I want you also to remember that the riches of knowing Christ and the riches of the, deep, of the depth of having a relationship with Him is found wherever you're at. Amen? And praise God we have His Word. But it's important for everybody to understand that God has an incredible super plan of salvation whereby He will save people out of the depths of darkness and darkness death and judgment and damnation and bring them into eternal life. And unfortunately, most people miss it. Most people don't seek after God. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. And all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Yeah, but the beauty is, as the scriptures say, that God has laid the iniquity of us all upon him, upon the Messiah. And in Genesis chapter 3, if you want to turn there, we see from the very beginning that man turned away from God. And it's a fact. Man is turned away from God. Man doesn't seek God. Man wants his own way. And we read in verse 17, Then to Adam the Lord said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles will grow up for you, and you will eat of the plants of the field and the sweat of your face. Uh, you will eat bread uh, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, and uh, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The death penalty, the reason hum humans die, is because of sin, because we rebelled against God, because God has seen fit in His justice and His righteousness to punish rebels against His kingdom with death, because He's the one who's given life. And the punishment is death. However, God had a plan. He had a super plan, as we're calling this message. A super plan for salvation. And that super plan included and rested upon the fact that he would bring a super seed. A super seed. A seed is that which brings life. If you want uh, the life of a tomato plant, you need to plant a seed. If you want uh, the life of any plant, you need to plant a seed. But look at verse 15. And God, uh, speaking again, he says, And I will put enmity between you, speaking to the, uh, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So there would be a seed. There would be enmity between Satan and the woman and her seed, and between your seed and her seed. And, you know, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So God promised that there was a seed that was coming. And it seemed as though Satan got victory because Satan had enticed humanity, the first human beings, to turn away from God. Because humans were given a choice. They could have partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or they could have resisted that temptation. They didn't have a fallen nature then, right? And even later in Genesis chapter 4, when Cain turns away from God and kills Abel, God says, you know, uh, he, he gives him an opportunity. He says, to, he encourages him to do that which is acceptable, but Cain, it says, was the evil one and, and killed Abel and what have you. And it's interesting because God promises, it seems like death is going to reign. I mean, they're dying. Thorns come up. Thistles come up. Pain comes up. Anguish comes up. They're going to return to the dust. They begin aging. They become shameful. They become guilty. They try to hide their nakedness with, with fig leaves because they're ashamed of who they become. And there's an inner shame that people still have, typically, unless they've you know, ignored the sinful people that we are. And God had a plan. And God plan promised a seed that would deliver them from Satan's power. And while Satan would be able to bruise the heel of the seed, the seed would crush or bruise Satan's head. And thank God, because we wouldn't have victory if God did not intervene and the seed of life did not come to give us life. So God's super plan entails, it rests around, it revolves around this coming seed that would come to deliver us. Now, of course, you know, you know Eve was waiting for this seed. God didn't give her a timeline, did he? He didn't. In fact, uh, when Cain and Abel, when Cain killed Abel, 
Abel was gone. It wasn't going to be Abel. Cain was of the evil one, and God had him banished from the area. They were kicked out of Eden, by the way, because of the sins of the first humans. But what's interesting about all of this is when Eve had her child, when Eve had a child to replace Abel, it's kind of interesting because uh, the way it reads is as though, you know, when she was waiting for this child to come, as though she understood that this might have even been uh, Seth. So it's quite interesting because when you look at uh, the text, you could look at chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Now the man had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now it's interesting right here. She had relations, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with uh, the Lord. And again, you continue to read. And then, of course, Abel is uh, put to death. And then she's really hurting. In verse 25, we read, Adam had relations with his wife again. And she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God, had a, God has appointed another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. Now, it's interesting if you look at it, for instance, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the man, backing up, now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man-child. Now notice it says, with, with the help of the Lord, but the help of is not in the Hebrew. That's why it's in italics right there. You can almost cross that out, because that's not in the original writing of God's word. But I have gotten a man-child, the Lord. Isn't that interesting? I've gotten a man-child, literally in the Hebrew, uh, it says, I've got a man-child, the Lord, Yahweh. And if you look at Lord, it's all caps. That's because it's not Adonai, which is uh, the common word for, for Lord, but it's, it's the actual tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. It's the very name of God. And it seems that it's very likely here, because it's not a normal construction in the Hebrew language, that she's waiting for the seed to come, right? And then all of a sudden, she has a child, and she thinks, and she says, now that, you know, it says, she says, I have gotten a man-child, Yahweh. That's literally what it says, Yahweh. And I'm not saying she's correct. She was, and obviously Cain wasn't Yahweh, right? But she's, what is Eve expecting? What prophecy did God give Eve? That she, there would be a seed from who? The woman, right? And that that seed would bring victory over Satan. So what I'm saying, there's already expectation by Eve, that God's bringing the seed, and it may be here that she's confusing Cain with the seed that God would bring. And Cain certainly wasn't the seed, was he? So I'm not saying he was a seed, certainly not. But she says, and by the way, this is kind of cool, because her thinking of the seed, she calls the seed here, or who she perceives to be the seed, who? Yahweh, God in the flesh, you see. And there was an anticipation from very early on that it wouldn't just be any old man that would come, but that God himself would come. In fact, we see throughout the Old Testament that the angel of the Lord appears, the messenger of the Lord, and often he's identified as Yahweh, pre-incarnations of Jesus Christ, as the angel of the Lord to deliver his people. Quite fascinating when you think about it. Now, who replaces Cain? I'm sorry, Abel, after Abel's killed. She knows it's not Cain, and she knows it's not Abel. He's put to death, and why does she name Seth? Appointed. Seth means appointed. So again, she's like, she knows there's a seed that's coming, and ultimately it would come through Seth's line, by the way, the seed that would come. But it wasn't Seth, and it wasn't Cain, and it wasn't Abel. There's a seed that would come to deliver humanity from Satan's power. Because prior to our fall, there was not a sin problem. There wasn't rebellion against God, and there wasn't death. But God was going to redeem us from death through the promised seed. So you could turn to Genesis chapter 18. And here we come again to this promised seed. And in Genesis chapter 18, the birth of Isaac is promised. And there's all these wonderful things that happen in, in Genesis uh, chapter 18. And it's interesting because it's in Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 12 that we see the seed is to come through Abraham. Of course, Sarah laughs in chapter 18 uh, because she feels like she can't have a child at at her old age and what have you, but God has a plan. Uh, and she was advanced in age, you read in verse 11, but God was going to bring this seed through who? Abraham. God chose a man by the name of Abraham to bring forth his seed. In fact, turn back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And this is an understanding I want you to have, and I think should be concrete in our minds, of this big picture. 
that I really think is integral to really understanding the rest of the Scripture, the rest of what the Word of God uh, talks about. And it says in chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abraham, this is before his name was changed to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And all the families of the earth, and all the families of the earth will be what? Will be blessed. It's through him and through his seed, as you read chapter 12 through 18, that all the nations of the earth will be what? Blessed there in verse 3. Now he says he's going to make them, Abraham a great nation. You know, and by the way, the borders he gave uh, to Abraham uh, of Israel, of the land of Canaan that it was given him, were stretched all the way from the land, uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. And we spent time at the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, and we spent time at the Dead Sea, and we spent time at the Sea of Galilee, and we spent time at the Red Sea. And the th three of those four are called the Red and the Med and the Dead Sea, you know, and we spent time at all of these. But if you were at the Mediterranean Sea, which is this beautiful, I mean, their lines, Israel's original lines were all the way from the Mediterranean. They were to be all the way to the Euphrates River. Huge. And they don't have that land right now. They have, they have a portion of it. But God had given that land uh, to Abraham. And if God owns the land, and he's the creator of the universe, it's up to him as to who he gives what. Amen. Now, it's interesting. The seed, he says, would come through Abraham. And it says in verse 3 that through the seed, all what? The nations of the earth would be blessed. That's, that's part of the super plan. God's going to bring this seed to defeat Satan, to liberate humanity, and that through this seed, not just Israel, God is choosing Abraham and his descendants as a means to bring forth the seed whereby all the nations will be blessed. And what's heartbreaking is most Christians don't understand this. Most Christians don't even understand this fundamental principle of God's plan. But God had a plan from the very beginning that all the nations, as many as, all the people from every nation will be blessed. Now, of course, not every nation will be saved, and not everyone will be saved, but people from every nation would be saved was part of God's eternal plan. Now, God, through Abraham, continued to build up his people, build up his people. And he told Abraham that in uh, 400 years, he was going to bring his descendants into the promised land. And you'll remember what happened when uh, they went into bondage in Egypt, after Joseph was rejected by his brothers and what have you, right after Joseph was rejected uh, by his brothers, uh, you know, he goes into Egypt and God uses him because remember, Joseph was rejected by his 11 other brothers and he ends up in Egypt. He ends up feeding the world uh, through his rejection. He's rejected by his own people, the 11 brothers representing the, the tribes of Israel because they were the sons of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to what? What was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. So they were Israel, the descendants of Jacob. Even before they went into the promised land, the descendants of Jacob were the descendants of Israel, were already being called Israel by God. They didn't even need a land to be recognized by God as the people of Israel. But through that 400 years that they spent in captivity in Egypt, God was dealing with the nations, the people groups that were inhabiting the land of Canaan, who were sacrificing their children, it says, to demons who were sacrificing their children in the fires and uh, committing all kinds of perversions and everything else. But God told Abraham, it won't be until they, they fill up the measure of their wickedness that I deal with them and then I'll bring you into the land. And God certainly did bring them into the land. But as they were delivered from Egypt by the blood of the Passover lambs, uh, which is another wonderful picture, God brings them toward the promised land. He brings them to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, he gives them the law, Right? He gives them the Old Covenant. We call it the Old Covenant Law. This is, I uh, had 613 or so laws approximately. Uh, of course, you've, the most popular laws are the Ten Commandments, which God wrote with his fingers on stone, his own fingers on stone. What happened when God, when Moses took the commandments that God wrote with his own fingers on stone and he took them down to the people below? What was Aaron doing? He was molding a golden calf, which in the Hebrew it literally means a young bull to be worshipped. And they were worshipping this bull as Moses is carrying the Ten Commandments. One of those commandments says, thou shalt not what? Have any gods before me or create graven images or you know, you know, worship idols, right? And they're doing this very thing as he goes down the mountaintop. What this is, is a powerful picture. 3,000 people die that day. It's a powerful picture as God's law of perfection cannot be met perfectly by humans. He has said, he says in the law that I've given you the power to keep these laws. He says that. 
But he also says that nobody's been able to do it. And that very law that God gave him at Sinai brought the death of 3,000 people. And in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and chapter 32, not long after they received the law, God says right after they received the law, you are going to be stubborn against me. You're going to harden your heart. You're going to be wicked and you're going to turn after other gods. And I'm going to judge you and disperse you into the nations. So God knew that that law wasn't going to save them. What that law basically did was reveal to them the holiness and righteousness of God, but also revealed the sinfulness of humanity and their own need for a savior. And that's why within the Mosaic law, there are all types of sacrifices. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, within the Mosaic law, it says that God has given the blood for life because the life is in the blood. and He's given the shedding of the blood for atonement, meaning for payment or covering of sin. So God knew they were going to break the law, but he also revealed that he had a plan to take care of their sin. Because the sin brings what? Death. What happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned? The very first chapters of Genesis, they died. So sin deserves death. That's why God interwove those sacrifices. Although those sacrifices could never ultimately what? Take away sins. Amen. That's why they're called atonements. And the Hebrew word for atonement means a covering. They cover the sin. They couldn't take it away. So God's plan is at work, but guess what? The sin of man isn't taken away yet. Why? Because the seed that God's promised of the woman has not yet come into the world. Amen? And the law was used to show that there would, be, there would need to be an ultimate uh, sacrifice, a substitution, where somebody would give their life for everybody, but only one person could, and we'll see who that is later. Eve gives us a hint of that when she thinks the seed has come, and she calls him Yeho- uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. Now, it's interesting because the plan moves on, and the Jews were heavily into the Old Covenant. They've got this covenant from Sinai. I mean, Moses' face was, you know, and by the way, those two, those two tablets of Ten Commandments, right? What happened? Moses, in his anger, threw them down. They broke. He thought, it's over. They're already blowing it, right? But to this day, many Jews believe that its salvation comes through the covenant that came to Sinai which was ultimately a covenant that was to bring life if they obeyed his law perfectly. Could it bring life, could it? It brought what? Death. In fact, it's called the covenant of condemnation because nobody could keep God's law perfectly. And it was interesting because when we're in Israel, just like the other times I've gone to Israel, you have different types of of Jewish people, but you have what you call the Orthodox and even the ultra-Orthodox. And where the law is held so highly, which such high esteem, you know, And it's thought that this old covenant, which we call the old covenant now, is the means whereby they are right with God. Yet the scriptures teach very clearly that nobody will be justified in God's sight on the basis of keeping the law. That's why forgiveness was so integral and so important. Now, it was pretty interesting because one of the scriptures I was able to share, and I love to share a lot of different passages from the Old Testament. Now, I was witnessing to Muslims and, and uh, different places, shopkeepers and so forth, uh, po- potentially jihadists, for all I knew, you know, sharing them about Yeshua and how Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But uh, many of us were also sharing with uh, the uh, uh, J- different Jewish people, having just an awesome time. And we went to various passages. But it's interesting, one night as we were sharing... And some of the most awesome times we had uh, were when we were sharing with, with people. And, uh, you know, when God, you saw God at work. And one night we went to Ben Yehuda Street. And Ben Yehuda Street, Ben Yehuda Street is like, if you go to Third Street Promenade, think of Third Street Promenade, but think of it as being, you know, 10 times more packed than that, up and down for a few blocks or so. Even, I'm not talking just on Friday night, but Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, on and on. It's just packed. And it's just people all over the place. Uh, and it was quite crazy. Ben Yehuda, by the way, was a man that God used to fulfill prophecy. Not only did the Lord say that he would disperse his people throughout the different nations, and Israel, they would cease to occupy it as a nation, uh, the land of Israel, for some time. And it would become a ruin. It would become a heap. In fact, it says in Ezekiel, if you read chapter 36 and 37 and 38, that people would come from different parts of the earth, and the, different, the nations would say, is this the land of God? What happened to it? It's a ruin. It's a heap, you know? What did the people do that God wiped out the land in such a way, it says? Well, when we were on a trip, I read a quote from Mark Twain, who visited Israel in the 1800s. And at that time, you know, Israel hadn't been a nation for about 1,800 years or more, actually. And Mark Twain visited there, and he said, we scarcely ran into one person. And it was a desolation. It was a, it was a ruin. 
And he said, I would never want to live here. And he said, it's hard to believe this is the same place that the Savior came to. And he was blown away, you know. Well, guess what, Mr. Twain, you were actually fulfilling Bible prophecy because it says the Gentiles would say these things. But it also says in Ezekiel 36 and 37 that God would bring his people, Israel, back into the land. Amen? And that they would multiply. In fact, in 1948, when they became a nation again, almost 2,000 years after ceasing to be a nation, approximately, it's amazing because it's, uh, they had about 100,000 people there then. Now there's over 7 million Jews in the land. And it says in this Ezekiel that, again, you'll, the kids will be playing in the streets. We saw that over the place. And the produce will be incredibly like the Garden of Eden. There'll be so much produce there. And it's amazing because when you're there, you just, whether you're in the north or you're in Jerusalem, more in the south, I mean, the, the hills and the mountains are covered with trees and orchards. And uh, one of the leaders in produce in the world is Israel now amazing. And, it's, and then it says, you know, then you look at the scripture, you say, this is how it become, and you just see it before your very eyes. Then it says in the book of Zephaniah that God would restore to them their pure language. You see, Israel ceased to uh, speak, uh, you know, the common language was no longer Hebrew. I mean, if you were in Germany, uh, you would be speaking usually Yiddish, which would be a combination of Hebrew and German. Or if you were, you know, say in Italy or Spain, you might be speaking Ladino, which is a combination of Hebrew and, uh, you know, Latin. So, or, or Spanish, I should say. Now, what's interesting about this is that now you go in the land and the first language of the natives there, the native Jewish Israelis, is what? It's Hebrew, you see. The English is their second language, and the language is restored, just as it says in Zephaniah. So the blow minds, you see these things fulfilled before your very eyes. The tragedy is, is that many, many Jews, and praise the Lord, there are Messianic Jews. There are Jews uh, that we met over and over again that know that Yeshua is the Mashiach. They know that Jesus is the Messiah, and it's awesome. Even shared the gospel with some of them, and it was beautiful. I mean, as, as teammates, you know, going out to the streets, and Jesus commanded us to preach the gospel to every creature, amen, to go into all the world, into all nations. And what was fascinating about it, it was, to me, one of the fascinating things is, is, is just to uh, be able to see their eyes open when they start seeing what the prophecies say about the Messiah. Because many of the Orthodox Jews, they focus on the Mosaic law. Many of them don't even read the Old Testament. They might focus, they'll read the Mosaic Law, or, and usually what they're doing is they're reading commentaries, they're reading rabbinical teachings, they're reading from the Mishnahs, you know, the Targums, they're reading uh, the Talmudic literature as to what the law means. But very rarely do they actually venture into what the prophets say about the law. And the, the sad thing is, is that the Talmud is, is elevated almost to the place of Torah, as though the oral tradition has become the Word of God. And it's so easy to get deceived. So what's awesome is you're able to open the prophets to them and say, hey, this is what the scriptures say. In fact, it's interesting. One night we went there and to Ben Yehuda Street and a couple of my daughters, or one of my daughters and, and one of, uh, I think it was, um, who was it? I think it was Heather and Alex were talking to Alex Fergang and they were talking to, uh, witnessing to some uh, Jewish Orthodox and Younger guys, you know, 18, 19 or so, and what have you. And then all of a sudden, before I knew it, you know, there were more and more of them crowding around to talk. And they were from England, you know, it says, you know, from the four corners of the earth, right? And there were, then there was another group who came who were more secular Jews, you know. There's another group who came, and I don't know where they were from, and they are dressed different than these other Orthodox. And also, we had this horseshoe around us, this big group, and going back and forth, and it was pretty awesome. And at the end, one of the uh, leader guys, you know, one of the older guys came, and, and he challenged me. He said, you know, uh, he goes, it's, on the, it's the burden of our proof is on you to show or prove that we are no longer under the old covenant as Jews and that God has brought in a new covenant. And he goes, the burden of proof is on you and you can't show us that because it's not in the, in, the, in the Tanakh. Tanakh is the Old Testament, Hebrew word for the Old Testament scriptures, the Torah and all the rest of the books. And he, and he kept going on and on. And you saw this happen to me before when I was uh, in an in a informal debate with a Pharisee there. And I thought, oh, I can't believe of everything this guy said. He said that. And I took him to Jeremiah 3, and I do this again with you because this is part of the big picture. And somewhere about you remember, you need to remember to go for, uh, you know, uh, an understanding of what the Bible prophesies. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, I read to him uh, verses 1 through 5, and then, then 6. And for the sake of time, because I want to get a lot of Scripture in, you can pick it up right at 6. 
And I read to him, it says, Then the Lord said to me, uh, In the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. So I point out that she had become a harlot. And in the verses preceding this, God warns that she, be, she became like a whore, a harlot. And he said, yes, I have to admit that my nation has you know, turned from God and they, they committed horrible sins. And I said, well, wait, look what the Lord says about this. And he says, I thought that after she had done all these things, she will return to me. But she did not return and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all the old trees, all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of what? Divorce. And again, he had said, no, God never divorced Israel. And I said, no, that sh God did. But at the same time, God's not done with Israel. You see, it says, I've given her a writing of what? Divorce. Yet her tre treacherous sister Judah did not fear, and she went and was a harlot also. Keep in mind, Israel was the whole nation, so to speak, but it, specifically it's built okay, the ten tribes in a technical sense because Judah uh, was to the south and so forth. But Judah did the same thing because at this point the, the tribes had been separated through a civil war. And the Lord says that, you know, Be Judah followed exactly and did what, what Israel did, became a harlot. And verse 9 says, Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land. See what it says? She polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. Now, are you following this? Because she polluted the land. And I, I talked to this man. I said, look, it says you polluted the land. God divorced you, Israel, and then Judah did the same thing. And, and as we talked about this, he says, well, that doesn't mean that he won't bring her back. I said, mm, he can bring her back, but not under the old covenant because she polluted the land. And I pointed out to him that God quoted Deuteronomy chapter 24, God's own law regarding his relationship with Israel and applied it to him, his own people for polluting the land, that he couldn't bring them back under that covenant as a, as a bride or as a wife. In fact, look at chapter 3, verse 1. God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will not that land be what? Completely polluted. But you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. In other words, the Lord is quoting Deuteronomy 24, and he says, if a man divorces his wife, she becomes the husband of another wife, and that man dies or sends her away in divorcement, she can't come back to him or pollutes the land. And God's saying, I've given you a right in the divorcement. And I can't bring you back because it will pollute the land. And there would, sense to be, there would seem to be a sense of finality there. And there is and there isn't. There is a sense of finality in regard to the old covenant. He can't bring her back under the old covenant, the covenant he made with her at Sinai. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and they were relating to God under that covenant. And as I shared this with this man, he admitted it was very compelling, but he said, but how do we know he's talking about the covenant that was made at Sinai? The covenant that, that God had Moses put in the ark. How do we know he can't bring her back under that? I said, good question. I said, but it's very, very clear. Look at verse 16 and 17. Verse 16 and 17. It shall be in those days when you are multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord. They will no longer say, what? The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. You know, I mean, they can make movies about the Ark of the Covenant, right? What's the big movie they made about the Ark of the Covenant? Come on. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay, I need help there, okay? <laughs> it shall be in those days uh, when you are multiplied and increased in the land, declares the Lord. They will no longer say the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. They're no longer to focus on the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And look what it says. And it will not come to mind, nor will they remember it, nor will they miss it nor will it be made again. You see, it's bringing the end to the Old Covenant. And as I read this to this man, and said, look, the focus of the Old Covenant. Oh, he says, well, maybe they're not going to miss it, and they're not forgetting it because they've turned away from the Lord. I said, no, it's wrong. That's wrong interpretation because the very next verse shows you that God has brought them back to the land, and it comes at a time when they're seeking God again, and they're right with God. In fact, look at the very next verse, verse 17. At that time, they will call Jerusalem what? The throne of the Lord. Why do you think the Catholic Church wants it to be an international city? Why do, you think, why do you think the UN wants it to be an international city? Why do you think the Muslims want it so bad? 
Why do you think Christians focus on it as a special place? And why do you think the Jews are there? By the way, keep in mind, in Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times by name throughout the Bible as God's city. Guess how many times Jerusalem is mentioned in the Quran? Zero. It was years after Muhammad died where they, you know, they said, oh, Muhammad, you know, went over there and ascended from his horse from Jerusalem. No, but look at when they're no longer saying the Ark of the Covenant. It doesn't, will no longer come to mind. It will, they won't remember it and they won't miss it. Nor will it be made again. Verse 17 goes on to say, and at that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all the nations will be gathered to it, to Jerusalem, for the name of the Lord, nor will they walk anymore. Now check this out. Nor will they walk anymore after the stubbornness of their evil heart. That's the context. When they're no longer rebelling against God, and it becomes, Jerusalem literally becomes the Lord's throne, and he's reigning there, they're not going to think about the Ark of the Covenant anymore, because guess what? Now they have the Lord, and it's the throne of the Lord, and all the nations gather to the Lord to worship him at Jerusalem. We read about that in Zechariah chapter 14. So I shared that with him, and then I turned to Jeremiah 31, which I'd like you to go there. And this, this scripture, I mean, if you write these scriptures down, if you're sharing with a Jewish friend who, who knows the scripture, who is into Torah, who's into the Old Covenant, you need to put these scriptures down. It's very, very easy. Just write down, you can take notes, Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, verses 16 and 17. Then chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a what? A new covenant. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You see, what happened under the old covenant? Israel blew it. They wouldn't come back to him, it says. It says they came back to him in pretense or deception, not with their heart. And they went after other lovers and they, you know, wed themselves to false gods. And he says, I give you right into divorcement. You're no longer going to say the Ark of the, the Covenant. But God's going to do something. He's going to take the evil from their hearts. Because he hasn't forgotten about Israel. See, some people will take a scripture out of Jeremiah and say, look, God's done with Israel. He divorced them, but they, they, they don't keep reading. Or he has another plan to bring them back, not under the old covenant, but another way. And what is that way? Through the Mashiach, through the Messiah. And he says it through a new covenant, a new covenant. Verse 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a what? New covenant with the house of Israel. And with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. Check that out, guys. What about the covenant at Sinai that he made with their fathers? He says, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. This is all Old Testament we've been reading, guys. This is Old Testament. It's the prophet Jeremiah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was, past tense, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. I'm going to make a new covenant, not like the old covenant that he made with them at Sinai when they left Egypt and they were given the Ten Commandments. You see, God says he divorced them. Not me, not an opinion, just a clear reading of Scripture. He says he divorced them under the old covenant. And in the future, the old covenant wouldn't even come to their minds. And he would take the evil from their hearts. And he would reign from Jerusalem. That's where his throne would be. And all the nations would gather to Jerusalem. Very, very clear. And that he'd make a new covenant with them. And that covenant would not be like the covenant made at Sinai. It's clear as day. When you're talking to a Jewish person or you're talking to a non-believing Gentile that doesn't know Jesus, they're in the same state now because we're all, everybody's broken God's law. Everybody is outside the grace of God. And the law basically brings what? Condemnation. Is it because the law is unholy? No, because the law is holy and we're unholy and it condemns us because we've broken it. And the land is polluted and we deserve death. But the only way we can be saved is if God makes some kind of new covenant whereby we can be saved. And what's that covenant going to consist of? Verse 33. But this is a covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Notice he's still going to make it with who? The house of Israel. After these days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their what? I will what? Forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now right now, you know, sin is 
constantly remembered under the Mosaic law. It's a constant reminder of breaking God's law and being in rebellion to God and trying to add up. But eventually, a new law will come to them whereby his word is written on their hearts, his moral law, where there won't be the teaching of all the rabbis and the Talmud, know the Lord, know the Lord, because they'll be taught by the Holy Spirit. They'll be taught by the Lord. And that's why when Jesus came, the night before his crucifixion, what did he say? He said that this bread is my what? My body. It represented his body that would be crucified, that would be put to death for them, for us. He took the cup and he said, he took the cup of redemption at the Passover Seder. And he took the cup and he says, this is the cup of the what? Anybody remember? Luke 22. This is the cup of the new covenant. Which is in my blood, he says, which is poured out for the sins of many. So Jesus Christ came to bring the new covenant. Moses said that in the last days, God would rise up a prophet like to him. That's quoted in the book of Acts of Yeshua, Mashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. And Moses said, Moses said, hear ye him, listen to that prophet, or ye shall die. You see, God was sending the seed, the one to bring in the new covenant, the one whereby Satan could be defeated and whereby God could forgive the sins of humanity. So we talk about the Old Testament and we talk about the New Testament. What we're talking about is the Old Covenant, right? And the what? New Testament. Testament means covenant. When we say turn to the New Testament, we're saying turn to the new what? Covenant. Well, is the new covenant just kind of added on? No, it's prophesied, isn't it? It was prophesied to come. In fact, what did God say after he gave them the law? That they would rebel against him, right? Right? And they'd be dispersed in the nations. Isn't that what happened? Well, also the Lord God prophesied when the seed would come, when the Messiah would come, what did he say would happen? It's very, very, very clear in Daniel chapter 9. And since I took the congregation to that passage a few weeks ago, I only reference it. But it's in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And by the way, I used this passage more than once when I was witnessing in Israel. And I use this a lot when I witness to Muslims. Because Muslims believe that Abraham, uh, or I'm sorry, that the angel Gabriel came to Muhammad in the 7th century. Guys, this is 600 years after Christ. 600 years after Jesus. Long after the Old Testament. And that Gabriel came to Muhammad and he gave him the Quran. He dictated what was to be put in the Quran. And it was written down by Muhammad's followers and eventually assembled. And as I shared with different Muslims, I pointed out that this could not be so. Because the contradictions from this being, this entity, this spirit claiming to be Gabriel, contradict the true Gabriel, which Muslims agree and admit appeared to Old Testament prophets. Because, but I point out, I mean, there was a lady, we're on the Dome of the Rock, we're at the Dome of the Rock, we're at the Al Aqsa Mosque, we're on top of Israel, uh, the Temple Mount. Jews don't go on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is where the Israel, uh, where, the, where the Temple used to be. But what happened? Jesus Christ said he would be rejected. And then he said that the nations or the, the Romans would surround Israel and they would turn, you know, throw down every stone of the temple. And it was quite a sight, as our tour guide, Arie, pointed out to all these stones, you know. Uh, you know, I've been to Israel three times now, so it's a trip looking at the different things going on around the temple. But we had a great spot where we could take pictures of these huge, radically big stones on the ground, Temple Mount, no more stones. Only stones you see are like the foundation stones for the temple wall, the wall that was outside the temple. But every stone in the temple was cast down. And as they ascended the southern walls, the Romans did, they pushed the stones down from the inside. And to this day, you could look down in the Kidron Valley and areas, you could see these piles of huge stones because the, te the temple was the biggest building on earth for some time. And that was the one that was, had been rebuilt or by, by Herod the Great. And it's amazing, as I talked to this, but on the Temple Mount, Jesus said, the scriptures say, Jesus said that the Gentiles would trample underfoot Jerusalem until the time the Gentiles are fulfilled. And God said, if, they, if Israel follows him with all their heart, guess what? They would occupy their own land and they wouldn't have the Gentiles overrunning them. But he said, every time you turn from me, I'm going to bring discipline. So to this day on the Temple Mount, because since the time, right after Christ was rejected, the temple was destroyed. And now we're almost 2,000 years later, 
and the Muslims are on top of the Temple Mount with the Golden Dome, the Dome of the Rock, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one a memorial building and one a place of worship where the Muslims come up and worship. And there was a lady visiting from uh, Ohio, a Muslim lady, and she attached herself to our group. She just started walking with us, and she came to the place where we were staying at Christ Church and started going on our tour with us. But she was a strong Muslim. I was tripping out, you know. And she went in and to worship or to go look at the al Mosque, and she went into the Golden Dome, and, and she came out, and, and I began talking to her. And I said, you know what it says, you know, it was inspired by Gabriel, the Quran, and I said, but it couldn't have been so. Because you see, Gabriel only spoke twice in the Bible, in Daniel and in Luke 1 and 2 to Mary. And he revealed to Daniel that the Messiah would be killed, would be cut off. And he told Daniel the prophet, because Daniel is praying for his people, he told Daniel, and you know the prophecy, after 69 sevens, 483 years, right? 360 day years. After the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, which happened, you read about it in Nehemiah 2, you count 483, 360 day lunar years from there, and it brings you around 30 to 31 AD when Jesus Christ was crucified. Because it says after those 69 sevens, the Messiah would be cut off. So anytime after those 69 sevens, Yeshua would be cut off, killed. And it says not for himself. You know what it says right after that? The very next thing it says, and it says it says to make atonement for sins. To bring in, in everlasting righteousness, you see. For us that believe, he is our righteousness, amen. He's atoned for our sins, right? And it says right after the Messiah is cut off, then you know what it says next? Then the temple and the sanctuary would be destroyed. That's in Daniel 9. That's great to show not only Muslim, but it's great to show Jewish people. Because guess what? When was the temple destroyed? In 70 AD, folks. In 70 AD. So you can learn from Daniel chapter 9 that the Messiah will be killed prior to 70 AD. Amen? Because you have the Messiah being cut off, then the temple being destroyed. And that happened in 70 AD. So the Messiah had to be cut off, had to have come, and had to have been killed somewhere between 30 and 70 AD. And guess who is the only one that fits the bill? Yeshua, the Mashiach. Amen? And as I showed this to her, I said, look, the Messiah will be killed. But Gabriel told Muhammad that the Messiah would, that, that Jesus never did even die. And then in Luke chapter 1, you read it, and Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her the child that she bears in here, that she has in here, is the son of the Most High God. So we learn two important things from Gabriel, that the Son of God would die for our sins. Those two truths are denied by the Gabriel that came to Muhammad, where it's taught that, Yeshua or Jesus was not the Son of God, and that he didn't even die. He just ascended to heaven. And as I shared that with her, she said to me, she goes, you know, I came all the way from America, spoke very good English, probably your first language, to see where my prophet ascended, and you're ruining my time, you know. And I just saw where he ascended from that. I go, he didn't ascend. That's a problem, though. And I go, maybe God's trying to show you something. Maybe, I mean, we've been praying to share with people, and all of a sudden you're in our group. And I said, I'm supposed to share the gospel with every creature. And if I know you're being deceived, how could I not share it with you? And I had some parting words with her, and she moved to another part of the group. It wasn't until a day later that she came back and started talking to me again. But I, my parting words, I said, you know what? They both can't be true. And look who came first. And I said, if I gave you a $100 bill, and it had somebody's, I think I turned around and saw Roger Fergang. I said, it had his face on it. Would you accept it? She said, no. I go, why not? She goes, because it's not the original. It's not a $100 bill. I go, you know, it's counterfeit because it doesn't match. I go, Muhammad came hundreds of years after Christ, and that Gabriel does not match the Gabriel of the Bible. By the way, I was using that illustration a lot because I'd go into the shop owners who want to sell you all their stuff, and Muslim shop owners, and, and they're a captive audience, you know, as everybody's shopping. I'm just sharing with them, you know, about Jesus, you know, and what the scriptures say. And we were having a great time, but I'll tell you what, guys. It's heartbreaking because she was like, well, that's your truth. This is my truth. I was like, well, man, she's got that American New Age mentality. I go, a square can't be a circle. I mean, these are, these are contradictions. They both can't be true. And, and she, you know, we decided to, you know, relax a little bit. And we walked in. And the last scripture I gave her was Jesus said, enter the straight gate. For broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many go that way. And straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few are those who find it. And as I shared this with her and we departed, 
the next thing, the very next thing we came to, because I missed like 20 minutes of the tour right there witnessing to her half an hour. And we're on the Temple Mount. The very next thing we're walking, she's over there, I'm over here, and Arie, our tour guide, you know, he brings us to this big gate as we're leaving the temple. And that's the big gate, and it's a gate that you open up if you have a bunch of, you know, luggage, or not luggage, but, you know, goods to go through, or horses or whatever. But he goes, we're going to go through the narrow gate, and there's a little narrow gate within it. And this is, you just, if you're just walking without the things, you can't bring the things with you in. Kind of like a picture of following Jesus into heaven, amen? And right after I say, you got to go through the narrow gate, I didn't have a clue that was coming up, you know? <laughs> Boom. And Ari is like, this is the narrow gate. <laughs> and this is a picture of Jesus, you know. I was like, oh, Lord God, you're amazing, you know. So we had an awesome time. And, uh, but God is not done with Israel, you see. Did you know that? In fact, when you're sitting there and you're hanging out and looking at all this stuff, you're like, wow, this has not happened for any nation ever, these things. But look at what God himself says. Verse 35 of Jeremiah chapter 3. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If the fixed order departs from me, uh, from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off the, the offspring of Israel and all they have done, declares the Lord. For all they have done, declares the Lord. In other words, and guess what? They're trying to measure space. It's kind of funny, huh? And they say, now we found out it's this big. And they're just still scratching the surface. And he says, this would have to happen and the sun and the moon and the stars would have to disappear. If Adolf Hitler, right, or Haman in the Old Testament, or Pharaoh, or, you know, any number of other people wanted to annihilate the Jews, you know what you have to do first? You have to annihilate the entire universe. You have to cause the sun and the moon and the stars to cease to exist. Because they'll, only if they cease to exist would God forget Israel. Amen? God loves Israel. God is not done with Israel. In fact, there's, a re, there's replacement theology, which is heretical theology, which says God is done with Israel. He's just turned to the Gentiles, to the church, and Israel's done. And everything that's happening over there is just a big coincidence. How ridiculous, man. Because God said he's not done with them and that he would also bring the new covenant to who? To them. And by the way, guess who are the first ones to receive the new covenant? The whole New Testament, the whole new covenant is written by Jewish believers, amen? And it says in Romans chapter 11, has God rejected his people? Paul says, God forbid. He goes, there's a harder than part that's happened to Israel. And he says, but one day he said, all Israel shall be saved for the deliverer will come out of Zion. And it says in Zechariah chapter 12, which I love sharing with the Jewish people as well. I'd go to Zechariah 12, and you guys are familiar with those verses. But if you begin at verse 1 or 2, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord. I, the Lord, it says, The Lord says this, They will see me whom they have what? Pierced. How can you pierce God? God is what? Spirit. Amen? Can you pierce the Spirit? No. They will see me whom they pierced. This is how. The very next part of the verse says, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. But they did pierce God. They will see me whom they pierced. But then it switches to the, from the first person to the third person. They will see me whom they pierce, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. Israel, when Jesus Christ comes back, it says in Revelation 1-7, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so. Amen. It switches from the first person to the third person because God became what? A man. God became God the Son. And he is already God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but God became the Son of Man and the Son of God. And that's throughout Scripture. You know in Proverbs 30, it says, do you know who, who the Son is? It speaks of the Father, but it speaks of the Son. In Psalm chapter 2, it says, you know, it talks about worship of God. It says, and kiss or do obeisance to his Son. It mentions his Son throughout the Old Testament. But his Son was revealed. God became a man. The seed finally came. And in, in, Revel, in uh, Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, it says a virgin would be found with child. His name would be called Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, to us, a son is born, a, a child is given. And he would be named Everlasting Father, or Father of Eternity, Mighty God. Amen. And it says, who would believe our report? We've read that, right, in Isaiah 53. 
to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed, and that the Messiah, it says in Isaiah 53, in the Old Testament, what a wonderful passage, what a wonderful time we had taking them through it. But wait, is it just for the Jews? No. Just as Joseph was rejected by his brothers and gave bread to all the Gentiles, so Yeshua, when he's rejected, he sent them out to minister to the Gentile world. And then again, he'll come to his own. And the most beautiful night I had, I mean, we had some crazy times. The Orthodox Jews are pretty heavy to witness to, some of them. I mean, if there was one night, we almost got stoned to death. I'm not kidding, literally. Okay, I mean, there were shirts there. I got stoned in Israel, and there was a bunch of rocks there. And you're not going to buy one of those because, you know, you don't want somebody to misunderstand that. But literally, one night was kind of crazy because we're witnessing on Ben Yehuda Street. Robert Seven was there. We were, we were sharing. And uh, who else was there with us? We had a Jewish man at the Bible Society that spoke fluent Hebrew and loved to witness to the Jews about the, who the Messiah was and open up the Scripture uh, with us. And it, it was, uh, who what, was there, Robert? Chris Williams was there. Who else? There's another brother with us, too. It was four brothers. Okay, that would be four brothers. We even had a sister there who was from Brazil that we met up there at Christ Church. And we're sharing. And, uh, and uh, somebody came up, Orthodox Jew came up, and he said, show me the scriptures. We're showing him Messiah the scriptures. He's getting blown away. And then five or six Orthodox come up, you know. And they try to pull him away, and they start telling him in Hebrew, you know, don't listen, you know, and what have you. And, and uh, the brother I was with, the Hebrew-speaking brother, said, follow my lead. You know, this could be dangerous. I'm like, dangerous, you know. These kids are in their mid-20s, and they're all like half my size, you know. But, uh, and before you know it, he goes, and all, all of a sudden it was kind of crazy because he says, we got to leave. And we talked to the guy a little bit more. We're leaving. And all of a sudden, before, he starts speaking very loudly. He's going down Ben Yehuda Street, you know, you know, Yeshua is a Mashiach, but it's all in Hebrew, loud. And the guy next to him, one of the highly Orthodox Jews is yelling too. And I'm like, wow, he wants to keep a low profile. So it's dangerous, but he's yelling. What's going on? Everybody's looking as we're going down. And as he takes a breath, they go, hey, what are you doing, man? He goes, I told him if he keeps following us, I'm going to preach Jesus, you know. And I go, what's he preaching? He goes, he's preaching. He's saying, beware of missionaries. Beware of missionaries, you know. And before we knew it, we had like 15, 20 of these guys surrounding us, whacking him in the head, kicking him in the legs, hitting him in the gut, you know. A bunch of guys stood in front of Robert, threatening him. I got people in front of me standing there just, I had one guy like a third my size. And he's like, you know, here he goes, we're not afraid of you. I go, hey, we just love you. We haven't raised our voice. We can share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know. And uh, I got a little in the flesh, you know, because they were, because keep in mind, one guy's picking a piece of asphalt. They want to stone us to death, okay? <laughs> like, wow, man. So this is what Jesus and Paul went through. Wow, you know, this is pretty gnarly. Uh, wow, that's crazy, man. And I told him, I said, you know what? It's because of Yeshua that you're still alive, man. And I try to let him know, man, because you know what? Because we went into dark alley areas and it was just us and them. We talked to three different cops on the way, different times, and they didn't stop it. And we thought, what's going to happen here? And my, my Jewish brother said, you know what? I've been through this before. We take them through the Muslim territories. Then they stop following you when they hit the Muslim neighborhood. I'm like, okay, I don't know if that's a godly plan, but, you know, <laughs> it was just really crazy stuff, you know. We went through the Christian Arabic neighborhood, and then they stopped. And I thought, that was my last night there. It was, it was incredible the whole way through all of these different experiences. But my best, my most favorite time of the whole trip was we went and visited the shelter. And I'll try to tell you this in just a couple minutes. We went to a place called the shelter down in Elat, the same place we did some snorkeling. And I love the shelter because a Jewish sister and her husband have opened up this wonderful shelter that different volunteers, and they've been ministering to the Jewish people for years. But it's not only just for the Jewish people, it's for whoever comes. And it's become like a, it's a, a church. And it's outdoor, attached to a house that's been turned into offices. And they've just given their life for the Lord. And when I was there, it was awesome because one of our goals was to mission, to witness to the Sudanese people and encourage them. And most of the Sudanese are Christians. And at that shelter, it was so beautiful because you had all kinds of Sudanese believers there. And they asked me to speak there. Uh, that was supposed to happen before I got there. And as I spoke, it was, it was neat because they had like five or six translations. So as I would say something, I would hear it in Chinese and Russian and and Spanish to the Cubans, and, and Arabic to the Sudanese, because two million of the Sudanese have been killed uh, by Muslims over there in the Sudan, and that's why many of them have fled to, fled to uh, Israel, where there, many of them are being taken care of. And it was put in all these languages. You know what passage I took them to? I took them to Revelation chapter 22 and chapter 21, where it says, God will remove the curse, and it says, there'll be no more death, and there'll be no more mourning, and there'll be no more pain. 
And I wept during that time. I, I, during worship, before I spoke, I was already weeping because I saw all these different ethnic groups worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ in, in Hebrew and, and, uh, and what have you. And, and it was a blow mine because I was seeing that scripture and I shared with them the passage of Revelation 21, 22 that says the, na- the, the, the people from the nations will bring the glory of the nations into God's kingdom. And I showed them what new Jerusalem would be like the new heaven and the new earth, and that all our tears would be wiped away. And there's a lot of suffering people there, a lot of hurting people there. And then in Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15, it says, Blessed is the one who washes their garments and goes in to that new Jerusalem. And I said, How do our garments get washed? We went to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 14, where there's a great multitude that no one can number from every nation and people and tongue in God's heavenly city. And it says, They were washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I mentioned, just as God has been faithful to Israel to keep his promises, and the sun and the moon and the stars would have to go away before he'd forget Israel, and he kept the promises, and we see it before our eyes in Israel, bringing them back so God will be faithful to us to bring the Sudanese, to bring the Cubans, you know, to bring the Chinese believers, to bring the Jewish believers, to bring, you know, all the believers into his kingdom, and we'll be in heaven forever. Amen? What a marvelous, incredible plan he has. And as Jesus said when he quoted the Psalms, the Old Testament, that he is a stone that the builders rejected. But that stone, the psalmist says, will become the chief cornerstone. Amen? So we await. Our seed has already given his life so we can be saved. Now we wait for him to come back and reign again. Amen? And and just like I can, it's hard to do. I cannot say if you were not there that night with the Sudanese and the Cubans and the Chinese and all these different believers, I can't communicate it. I can say it. It was so beautiful when you're there. It was a little foretaste of the kingdom. But guess what? When you fellowship with other believers from other backgrounds in Jesus, and you see his work and the beauty of unity in Christ, you get that same foretaste on whatever level. Amen. So praise God that we have unity in Christ, and it's through him that God is bringing redemption to whoever will in the world. Amen. If you've heard this message, you say, wow, that's an incredible plan that God has. I can be forgiven through Christ's death, and I can be incorporated and death and the curse and all that's defeated in Christ. I want to be saved. I want to know Christ. All you have to do is simply turn to Christ right now and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to be a partaker of the new covenant whereby you remember my sins no more and where you give me a new heart. He'll do that today. I want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. Uh, Our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you till next time.